Good evening, all. I'm Marty, N6VI, and my co-presenter is Barry Porter, KV1PA. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I will first say that I am not an expert in this area. However, um, I have extensive conversations with people who are experts in this area, and I know some of you have your own experiences that uh, hopefully we can make this kind of a, an informative session that a lot of people contribute to. So let me share my screen for just a second. <clears throat> All right. Can everybody see the map? Yes. All right. Oops. Oh, no. My... Uh, I'm freezing up here. All right, um, so let's take a look at this map. Um, this is federal lands. Um, you know what, I'm going to log in on the other computer because now this thing is freezing up for me and uh, I don't want to. Uh... We'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, doggone it, sorry about that. No problem, we'll talk bad about you while you're waiting. Oh, please go ahead. Um, well, Walmart is rebooting. I mean, I can talk a little bit about uh, my experience. We had a repeater in Boston on top of the Federal Reserve Bank building. And the reason why we had it there was because we sat down with the building manager and we had great relations with the security people and with the building owners. And they thought that the Red Cross repeater would be perfect on there. And it was a great location. It was probably the highest spot in eastern Massachusetts. And the repeater reached all over New England. Well, the bank on the building manager changed. And the building manager was not very pro amateur radio. He saw dollars for every square foot in the top of that building. And he said, Why should we allow you to be on here for free when we can charge clients thousands of dollars a month? to have this location be gone within a week hmm. so we find a new location for our uh, repeater it all comes down to we had we had a here down in florida we had a great repeater on top of the va hospital and the va hospital here in palm beach is probably the highest point in all of southern florida south of orlando and we had a great relationship. We had a we had a veterans amateur radio club, which we you know, we allowed the any you have to be a veteran you know be taken care of by the VA to use it. Then they had a change in administration, and again it was a matter of security. The guy from security did not like having non vetted people. I said, if you want us to vet us, you know, please go ahead and do background checks on all of us. We've all been in the service. We've all had our background check before. And he said, no, he wants to personally know anybody that goes up on the roof and no one in our club would be allowed on the roof. And he said, be gone from there. So we had to take the repeater off of the air. Oh, geez. Is, is my, is my uh, screen still showing? We're looking at Southeastern for uh, United right. States. Right. Okay. Good. So this is just kind of zooming in on the uh, on the legend of that first map, uh, showing the various agencies that it addresses, and you can see, uh, and that you know the big ones for us are the Forest Service and uh, uh, Bureau of Land Management. It's probably the two biggest ones, and then uh, quite a few other agencies as well. So this is what we're dealing with, and of course, you know, once you get west of the Rockies. There's an awful lot of place that is federally controlled. Now, um, there's good news and bad news, and that is the, the I guess the you know the bad news, of course, is that uh, there are some big hurdles to getting something up uh, on on a on a public site, uh, and we'll talk about those. The good news is that at least for the Forest Service and the Park Service and the BLM, there are rules, there are laws that. Um, must be followed, but at least they're there that require them to make access available to the public. So unlike private land, there are there is a mechanism where you can uh, where you can do that. So let's stop the share and just talk about uh, a couple of different uh, 
uh, situations. Uh, there was a member of, of the Rat Pack who asked this question, and so I thought it'd be a good to good to kind of go over what we know a little bit. And uh, some of you may have information that I don't. Um, because so much of the advantageous terrain for repeaters is federally controlled, um, you have to look at uh, you know where you want to site this thing. Uh, the most difficult is going to be if there is no existing communication site. Uh, on a on a particular piece of federal property. So now you've got these following hurdles. First, you have to convince them that there's the, convince the agency in charge that there's a need for this uh, for this site. Uh, you have to arrange the right of way for construction and for maintenance access. You have to arrange for power to the site. Uh, uh, you need to pay for a soils engineer. You need to pay for an archaeologist. All the things you do to put up a you know, a building somewhere. Uh, and then, of course, you have to have an environmental impact report. Uh, and the agency will require, uh, to have, they'll have to develop a site plan, even if you're the only one there. There has to be a site plan involved here. And uh, uh, in, in, as in the case with virtually any public land location, you will eventually, sooner or later, have to pay to dismantle, remove, your property and restore it to its original condition at the end of your uh, lease term. Uh, this is something that was common in the oil and gas industry where they got drilling rights. They had to DRNR, they had to, uh, you know, set aside money. And in the case of the Forest Service, um, we were in a, involved in an interesting negotiation a few years back, about four or five years back, um, where the Angeles National Forest was one of the first ones to implement uh, a uh, collect the DRNR in advance from all users. And they came up with their own estimate of how much it would take to dig out the concrete, to haul everything away. And they had the, we asked why they're doing this. And they pointed to a couple of cases up in the Pacific Northwest where site owners abandoned the site and the government had to clean it up at public, you know, taxpayer expense. And they said, you know, this is a big problem for us. We can't have that you know, going on. So we have to have, make sure you guys pay for it. And we want you to collect, we want to collect it up front. Well, A, their numbers were huge. And B, that, that would probably drive out most users at the get-go. Um, I did a Freedom of Information Act request about those specific sites they mentioned. And it turns out the amount they actually spent to clean them up was very small compared to what they were claiming when they negotiated with us. So I faced them with that. And then I said, look, if you want to collect these big numbers from everybody up front, you're going to end up with the very situation you're trying to avoid, and that is people walking away. Uh, you know, if you say, yeah, you guys have to come up with $75,000 right now, uh, they're going to walk away and you'll get you'll get what you hope not to have, okay? Uh, so I developed a, a proposal to uh, say, look, if you have to do this, why don't you make it you know, payable in installments over the lease term or a significant portion of the lease term uh, so that it doesn't, you know, it it's, it doesn't become an, an unworkable financial burden. And uh, every month you'll be a little closer to that protection. And we also came up with various ways to uh, adjust their Forest Service estimates of what it would take to remove this stuff. Uh, one, uh, one repeater owner, he basically hired a, a contractor to do an estimate, give him a written estimate. And they took, they accepted the estimate, you know, um, another said, Hey, look, you know, if we remove the concrete, the road that you have through there is no longer shored up and you, you know, you'll be better off if we leave the concrete in and, you know, reinforce that road. And they finally agreed to that. So that took a big chunk of the expense off. Removing concrete is one of the most expensive things. Um, so be aware that anything you put in eventually is going to have to come out. And whether it's your obligation or that of some other group that takes over for you, uh, the obligation is going to be there and you're going to have to pay it maybe sooner, maybe later. So all of those, uh, all of those things add up to making you know, a site where there is no existing communication uh, facility very, very expensive. Commercial guys can do it because they've got the money to throw around and the money to lose, we don't. Uh, so you probably just about give up on that. Uh, 
moderately difficult, but possible, is where you have an existing communication site, which means there is an existing site plan. Now, those site plans are not um, published, but they are public. So you have to hunt for them. You may have to ask for them. But if you look at the site plan, it will say where they can have buildings, where they can have antennas, uh, where the power can run, all this sort of thing. And then assuming you want to have your own facility there, and that could be anything from putting up a building to putting up a uh, just an outdoor cabinet and a mast, um, uh, make sure that whatever it is fits into that site plan. And so get the copy of the site plan, uh, identify a location for your proposed structure that is consistent with that site plan, uh, submit the plans to the agency for approval. They may require a building permit or they simply their own, their own uh, structural evaluation and approval. Uh, you'll probably need to explain to them uh, why aren't you renting from an existing user? Well, the existing user is American Tower, and they want to charge us fifteen hundred dollars a month, and we can't do that, you know. And I don't know whether whether that argument would fly on its own, but it's certainly a a relevant one. Um, then normally you're going to have to submit uh, detailed information on your equipment, not just what frequencies you're operating, the IFs, the power levels the patterns of the antennas and so on, because if they have multiple commercial users up there, uh, they're under an obligation to make sure they don't add another user that's going to interfere with the existing ones. So um, even wants to do a field day up on, uh, on Fraser Peak, uh, you know, I had to submit all the, all the technical details of all our radios and antennas. And of course they didn't know what to do with it. So they gave us the permit, but in in a permanent facility situation, they would probably scrutinize that pretty carefully and maybe even bring in some of the other uh, site users to assess whether or not it would cause a problem for them. So the you know if you're the last one on the site, uh, you have to deal with all the you know making sure that you're not bothering all the other users, and that means you have to design your site to certain specifications. They may say, okay, you can't use any coax adapters. Uh, you can't use flexible, uh, you know, you can't use uh, LMR 400 going up a tower. Uh, uh, you, you have to use low PIM uh, connectors and, and hangers and everything else. Uh, they want to make sure that what you do doesn't degrade the performance of the site for the other users. So, you know, you should know what those are and talk to somebody who's familiar with this if you're not, if you're not already familiar with it yourself. Um, uh, you may have to get structural, electrical, and other kinds of permits. Um, again, a, an outdoor cabinet and a mast, if that will suffice for your needs, may be a lot easier to, to justify and to put on, put in than a, a whole new building and its foundation. Uh, <clears throat> if you're going to have a generator on site, there are um, environmental considerations in terms of the changing the oil and storing the fuel. Uh, if you're going to use batteries, uh, there are containment issues with the battery liquids. If it's not uh, if it's not lithium iron phosphate, if you're using you know lead acid batteries, uh, you may have to have containment facilities for those. You have to talk about how often you're going to change those batteries so that they don't uh, you know they don't swell and split and and uh, send acid all over the place. Um, I, ordinarily, you, you'd have a good plan for that anyway. I mean, you want to keep your machine running. Uh, you don't want to be running, you know, old dead batteries that you're just forcing current into until they blow up. Um, and again, figure out what it's going to take you to remove that at the end of service, even if it may be 20 or 30 years away. Come up with your best estimate, and you'll have to give that to them, and then they may tack that onto your monthly bill, or they may say pay it up front, depending on the agency. The easiest well, you have to have certified tower climbers. Yes, yes. Uh, any 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 climbing work uh, they may require be done by somebody who's got you know certified uh, climbing certificates, which means they've, they've they pass certain classes and safety rules and so on. I've done a lot of climbing on mountaintops and and nobody's ever bothered me about it. But uh, some places they may be a lot more a lot stricter than others. Now I use all the OSHA you know, climbing gear and everything else. I'm pretty careful, but uh, you're right, Barry, that, that could be another requirement. And you may have to have uh, 
escorted access, depending on the location. Uh, they may say the only time you can get up there is you have to have one of our people with you, and that takes time and money, so you're going to have to pay for them to, to hang out there while you go and do your work. Um, so as I say, the easiest, uh, but perhaps the uh, most costly, uh, other than starting from a, a bare site, is to rent space from an existing user. Now, uh, that usually doesn't require any agency approval. Depends on the on the site agreement. Uh, you know, certain users may say, "Okay, anything you can fit in this building, you know, is okay. You don't have to pay extra rent." Um, uh, so you would submit uh, information to assess uh, the compatibility with the host site and any other users. Uh, you may have to add a rack to the tenant's building and maybe add some antennas on their tower. Uh, obviously, you're going to pay monthly rent, and again, that could be really exorbitant if you're talking to a, you know, an American Tower or one of those that are basically in it for the money, um, and probably pay a share of the utility costs. Um, there are some commercial site users uh, where maybe they're running a, a repeater system for an ambulance service or something who are hams and are ham friendly. Some hams get away with no monthly rent and just sharing the utilities. Uh, some get away with paying virtually nothing. It depends on your relationship with the people who are already uh, ensconced at that location. But uh, again, that that that's the easiest way in terms of the work you have to do, but perhaps not always the least expensive. Um, now, in that map we showed earlier, um, <clears throat> Uh, some states, you notice, even though they have a lot of federal land, and uh, we have some people here from Washington, so we, maybe they can comment. Because when I approached some of our uh, ARL folks up in Washington, they said almost all our repeaters are on state land. And uh, the state, you know, we have agreements with the state that allows us to do this. And so you basically avoid all the, uh, all the uh, administrative and other requirements that apply to federal land, so that that would be interesting. Now, um, I you know most of my experience and those of my the folks I'm working with are with um, National Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. Uh, Bureau of Land Management um, often they're quite amenable to having you uh, move a structure, put up a structure, or add to an existing one, or whatever it may be. But the problem is. Usually you don't make any, they don't make any money at that. So if they have other users, we have one case for a big repeater system here where it's been permitted and the existing owner abandoned the building. And so we want to get permission to move to the building that has the power. You know, everything's already up there. But they said, you know what? We you we don't make any money from you. Uh Anything you know, you you're at the bottom of the pile, and if anything new comes up as you're rising up the pile, we put it on top, and you go back to the bottom of the pile. Okay, so uses that that affect their uh, revenues always take precedence over uh, uses that don't generate revenue for them. So that that could be very frustrating. We have one site where we're ready to go; everything's there, and if they look at it, we know they'll approve it. But they've sat on it for. 12 years, okay, that that could be very, very frustrating. And it's a key site for us to uh, link a couple of, this is a repeater system that doesn't use internet for most of its links. It's all RF. And uh, uh, this is a key site and a key backup path uh, linking uh, uh, California and Arizona. And, um, you know, we'd love to get it going, but we can't. We have another site that was uh, we shared with uh, an FAA site. The problem is there was a huge forest fire and all the power lines went down, you know, and, and were lost. And uh, Southern Cal Edison uh, didn't want to pay. They didn't want to incur the cost of running new lines up there. And the FAA said, well, we don't want to incur the cost of running lines up there. So everybody's pointing fingers and nobody's putting power up there. So we said, well, maybe we can do something with solar. But now you've got all the structural issues of, you know, putting up something to, to hold up the panels and uh, uh, will it generate noise at the site and all this thing. So uh, this stuff can be very, very frustrating and it can take a long time. But especially if you know somebody, if you have a, 
a good relationship with an agency at another site, perhaps, uh, you will get more favorable treatment. You're more likely to get listened to um, and have, um, you know, have your ducks in a row, you know, have looked at the site plan, try to make sure you do things that are a commercial spec, you know, don't slop things, do it right. Neat wiring, neat cabling, appropriate fuses and other protection devices. Um, and, you know, we have, we have sites in the, in the San Gabriel mountains uh, above Los Angeles where our, uh, our volunteers keep the place so spick and span in terms of weed clearance, in terms of all the wiring on the walls and the cabinets. I mean, the inspectors come in once a year and they say, this is the cleanest site we've ever seen. Okay, that's what you want. That's the reputation you want when you when you go and, and put things up. You don't want to be the the uh, the one that does things sloppily. So that's that's a lot of the information I got. But let's let's hear from others. Maybe first with Barry, and let's see if we have some others. Oh, no, I'm about to mention national parks. Uh, as you mostly know from the uh, the parks on the air program, national parks are generally very friendly in terms of you having temporary operations at the parks. Uh, uh, but I know we have uh, Dan, uh, WL7COO here, who worked for the service for a long time. And, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to putting up permanent structures, uh, that may depend on your relationship with the, the folks in charge at that location. They can be very, very friendly, or, you know, they may put up a few roadblocks. So I'd like to hear from others on uh, what they've experienced on that. So, Barry, why don't you go ahead and then let's turn it over to Dan and, and some others. Okay, sure. Well, first of all, county and state land is much easier to put stuff on than uh, federal yeah. land. And especially if you have good relationships with your agency, you can uh, co-locate with their equipment. And a lot of the groups down here have made agreements that, hey, we will help maintain your equipment if we allow to put our equipment in there and we will keep it neat and we will keep it up to spec because a lot of the local towns and cities don't have the staff to properly keep up equipment like that. And the hands love to do stuff like that. Uh, so that's one of the most important things you can do. Again, it comes down to making relationships with the people that you want to do. We had, we had one of our highest condo towers. We have, Five repeaters on the roof of this tower. It was it was the not it was a private tower, and the president of the condo association was a ham. So he loved having the repeaters on his roof. Except so one day, the board of directors decided that they wanted to resurface resurface the roof, and they didn't give any guidance to anybody, and they didn't let anybody know. But all of a sudden, our repeaters were off of the air. They cut all of the coax because it went up through the roof, and they had to seal the roof. So all of a sudden, they cut all of our antennas off, and we had to figure out another way to uh, get the coax up to the antennas. And it took us over a year until we finally got all of the repeaters back up on the air. Mm. So you got that not only with federal, but with private uh, and uh, groups, but especially with some of the high office buildings that we have mm -hmm. down there anyway. And, and up north, we had the same problem, that space on top of the buildings, very, very expensive and very valuable. And if they don't see a need, they're going to tick you off. That's why it's so important to get statistics on how many hours our volunteers do and save the government and save the private entities from uh, emergencies when we use our repeaters and we train on their repeaters and we exercise with all of their teams and get to know them better. This way, that when, if you're depending on it, you're going to have facilities and uh it, it all comes down to being sure you know your building managers, being sure you know the facilities managers, and it takes a lot of groundwork and continuing groundwork to be sure that everything is uh, up to spec. You can even look at hams are very good at doing measurements and checking things out that a lot of the commercial and government agencies can't do. So if you offer trade, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do this kind of work as long as you let us keep our repeater here. Another interesting thing that Marty didn't mention was the batteries. We had one uh, police agency that wants to have, have massive backup batteries. They said, oh, we'll just dig a hole, put the batteries in the hole, and cover up the hole so no one will know that it's there, and then we'll have all this battery backup. And we said, I don't think that's a good yeah. idea. Uh, these things are going to leak. They're going to contaminate the ground. 
And when they flood, you're not going to get anywhere near this tower. But you need to put these batteries up on a concrete slab about four feet above the ground because that was above the estimated flood stage of the area. And they thanked us so much for this advice. It saved them at least a half a million dollars, which would have cost them if that place had uh, flooded. So, yeah, we, we have services that we can offer for free that a lot of these agencies don't have the people to do or the technical background to service. And we can do a swap. You know, you you let us keep our, our repeater here. We'll do all of this work for you. We'll check it out and we'll do a great job for you and we'll keep it clean and we'll keep it organized. And that's the way to do it. I mean, as long as you know, and, 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 and please let us know if there's someone that's going to change in the administration so I can sit down and meet with them and talk with them so they understand why we're here. And that will save you lots and lots and lots of heartache. Back to you, Marty. Very good. Very good. Good ideas. And, you know, the, the idea of trading labor, and it doesn't necessarily have to be technical labor. Suppose you guys agreed to, say, do all the weed clearance twice a year at that location, with it maybe subject to uh, to fire danger. Uh, yes. If you're not if you're not taking a job from somebody who's, you know, uh, you know, a union person who, who's, hey, you know, if you do that, I am out of a job. Uh, uh, but it's something that they'd have to go and hire resources to do and you say, we'll, we'll do that for you. Uh, that can go a long way too. A goodwill, all the goodwill. Yeah. That we can Yeah. Let's see if we can get uh, Dan WL7 COO, talk a little bit about the, the forest service side of things or the uh, park service side of things. Hang on here. Uh, Gene has his hand up for quite a while. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Gene, go ahead. Okay. It's no problem. <clears throat> well, I was teaching at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. My amateur radio club had two, repeaters, uh, a two meter one and a six meter one on top of the old hospital located on Fort Bragg. Worked fine, no problems whatsoever. And I never really thought about what was involved with getting permission to do that. I mean, the government was involved as far as the installation of anything. I mean, it was the members of the ham radio club who did everything and maintenance afterwards and all that kind of good stuff. I'm just wondering what what how do you approach the federal government from the military side to get permission to do something like this? I mean, that's a pretty broad question. I apologize. Wow, a good question. Uh, maybe somebody has some response there. I I would first note that uh, if if let's let's say you have uh, uh, an Aries group and you exercise periodically with say the National Guard and. Uh, you know, our experience, National Guard folks have great equipment, but they don't know how to use it. And they can be up at a hilltop with their millions of dollars worth of stuff, and they can't talk down to the valley because nobody knows how to operate the stuff. So, you know, we can do training sessions. We can do various things for them. And if you if they get used to working with you and know that you guys know what you're doing, that may open a door right there. Uh, the other is... If you're involved with the uh, a military affiliate radio system or MARS uh, and you're active and you participate regularly and document your your involvement, uh, that may open a few doors uh, to, uh, you know, to the appropriate people. Okay. Thank you for that. I was just uh, I was just thinking, that, you know, anything doing with the federal government, especially the military, it's going to be a ton of paperwork. <laughs> I mean, it goes up down up down up down you know approve this one the other one doesn't get the officer in charge of the base licensed <laughs> <laughs> that'll make well, magic here, happen here at Fort Hood, i don't know i don't know i don't think there's any uh ham radio equipment on the post except for probably any vehicle well, you'd be surprised well yeah they probably i mean yeah but i mean uh, as far as like repeaters go uh, no there's none yeah. Especially, you know, especially these days, you know, the the shares program uh, through uh, through uh, FEMA that that's or DHS rather that that's something that maybe a lot of bases are participating in, and they may not have people are that familiar with how that all works, and that is something that a lot of hams either know or can come up to speed on very quickly. If you're assisting them with something like uh, you know participating in the shares program. Uh, that could uh, uh, that could open some doors as well. Okay. The base 
at radios on the military systems. You might want to talk to the director of security of the base to see where his radios are. Maybe talk to him about maybe having an amateur radio co-located located with them. If it's, an, if it's an active facility, you want to talk to the commanding officer who's in charge of the facility. If it's an abandoned building, you talk to the base public works, and they would have someone that would probably know who to talk to. Good ideas. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Hey, Tom, you got your hand up. You want to take the floor for a moment? Yes, sir, and thank you. Can I be heard? Yes. Okay. A um, couple of things I wanted to contribute, and one of them is power security. Uh, it was decades ago, but we were on a site in Massachusetts, and they had a generator that was older than any of us for this state site. And uh, what we did was we found a generator that was being taken out of service in favor of a larger one in what was then the Bell system, the phone company, uh, and approached them very gently and carefully, and they donated the old set. And then we were able to get the old set reconditioned to the original manufacturers, in that case, own and specification. Uh, and we moved that over there, and it was like half the age of the one they had on site and much bigger capacity. Uh, and we acted like we were doing that only for us up until the point where it was about to go operational. And we uh, said, Who do, whose permission do we need to run the cables to your shelters so that you'll be on this emergency generator too? And all of a sudden, we were the best buddies in all the world. Um, another thing that happened was we were on the roof of a federal building over here and uh, out by Dulles uh, Airport in uh, Northern Virginia. And uh, the, the grounding had somehow gotten really messed up. And since I was in that business of, of site uh, preparation and installation and ma management, uh, I simply went back to the truck and got a ground bar and put the ground bar in where the old stuff had been mounted, but was had been, somebody had massacred the stuff. I don't know how they man had, maybe they were moving a piece of equipment. I don't know. But I, I put that back in, tied it into the building's ground system exactly where it should have been, where it appeared to have been before. And in the meantime, I, I always have emery paper and, you know, wire brushes and stuff, I buffed up every connection that was the least bit open, added a copper shield to the connections, which is a antioxidant for copper, uh, expensive stuff, I might add, and uh, tightened everything up to spec. And somebody called maintenance and asked to speak to whoever was on the roof. And maintenance came up and said, Skydies, it was the FBI. Hmm. One of their pieces of equipment was suddenly back to functioning, and they wanted to know what we did. <laughs> so I told him, and he said, so where do we send the uh, attaboy letter? <laughs> <laughs> and we told him. But right. that meant that thereafter, when the question came up with uh, General Services Administration, we had a lot of uh, tie in there with them. A thing to remember that's very important in some cases is none of these various federal agencies outside the Department of Defense own their buildings. The GSA does. They're all tenants to the GSA, each and every one of them. Mm. Uh, there are some exceptions in the National Park System because they're in charge of preserving some important historical monuments and so forth and directly charged with the ownership and maintenance of those but other than that if you're not dod you're mm -hmm. a tenant of the gsa so why that becomes important we were getting stonewalled by a particular agency who just flat didn't want us there so we were nasty about it we turned around and, uh, and approached the uh, council of governments who had you know had been very friendly with us before and the council of governments called the gsa and said here's the situation and by the way, we really need these guys. So the GSA called up the agency, which of course I won't name, and said, you realize that roof doesn't belong to you, don't you? 
Mm. They, they were all upset and annoyed, but he mm. said, that roof doesn't belong to you. You don't need it. You have no business being on it unless you contact us first. The GSA keeps the elevators in their buildings up to date and stuff like that. It's all done by the GSA. Mm. The GSA said, so we're granting permission for this installation, and we'd appreciate it if you'd quit, you know, being a pain in the neck. Wow, that that's great. And that there's a flip side to that. Um, uh, and and this this kind of got around a few years ago uh, <clears throat> when there was a particular repeater group in uh, Northern California uh, who uh, <clears throat> got kicked out of a site. Apparently, they'd never gotten formal permission. And um, they kind of went on a big PR campaign saying the state no longer needs ham radio. Well, I mean, that wasn't really the case. But what happened was, and this this could happen, um, <clears throat> the uh, I think this was the California Fire Authority or something. You know, they formed a department to deal with all their real estate issues. So rather than being each site person being responsible, they had a central group now that just deal with nothing but real estate issues and therefore the leases and therefore, okay, we want a list of all the tenants and all the equipment and anything we can't identify with a, with a, 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 a tenant with a signed lease, get it out of there. Um, so, you know, even within a department where you have friends, you have to look and see, you know, where the authority lies to uh, approve or disapprove occupancy and use of one of their facilities. Yes. Very I wasn't well. suggesting that you risk no. alienating anybody, but uh, sometimes you have to find another door. And one of the other doors was that we contacted a senator in a case where we were being stonewalled about something. And our letter went in one of her envelopes. And I Ooh. worked in a federal mailroom for a time. <laughs> and she she put a cover letter in there saying we I appreciate if this were given more timely uh, consideration. I worked in a federal mailroom. When something came from a senator or representative's office, you stopped what you were doing immediately. Nothing else mattered. And you ran it up to the director's office. And the director had a person in their office that took that letter and took it any place it had to go and while they were standing there whoever had to do anything with it better get it done or the director's going to be on the phone because <laughs> they they don't want to annoy senators and representatives for obvious reasons uh and explaining that you know that this particular thing was being used by uh skywarn uh, and it really was in that particular area. It was the only one that could cover the whole area. Um, that that's what sold the senator on it. Huh. And, and she uh, turned around and said, "I'd appreciate if this got uh, quicker consideration." And it, we got dizzy with how fast they changed their attitude. You know, it's just like <laughs> spinning Excellent. around sideways. Uh, and the power security thing. We had a backup generator on one of our sites, quite large. It was donated that was portable, allegedly. I call them transportable because nobody picks up a generator in the five. Your, 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 forkli your forklift puts it on a trailer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So when uh, a terrible snowstorm, I mean, so bad that the snow height was four feet and then there were the drifts. And this was up in Massachusetts came in. It's a record breaker. It's back several decades ago. Um, when that happened, we not only made sure our equipment got it back in operation on snowshoes, no less. We tied into every generator inlet on the site. We dragged the cords, and if they had a generator inlet, we connected to it with the labeled power that was on the generator unit. And because it was surplus GI, it had a lot of labeled powers in it. After that, we were somebody's fair haired guys because anything we asked for, we got. You so, put them back on the air. Yeah, several. A lot of them have batteries and backup generators. But one of the things we ended up doing was pulling bladders in there uh, on skids because, you, you know, they couldn't even get the major highways plowed out. 
So we got on our snowshoes and pulled a diesel bladder in there and tied it into one agency generator that was doing that low fuel alarm thing on its outside telltale. And we didn't have any interest in seeing them go off the air any more than we wanted our own stuff off the air. And, and one little thing like that, coming to the attention of the right people, is just golden. You can't underestimate the value of that. Wonderful. That's all I have. Thank you. When you're dealing with agencies, you agree to their terms. For example, the Forest Service and the Park Service. You you have to agree, if, for especially for field days. You know, I learned that on the federal property, they don't want you to pound stakes in the grant in the ground for tents or for antennas or anything. And the the security people and the rangers will come around and check your site to be sure that you're not penetrating the ground because they have regulations about that. If you don't get permission ahead of time, they're mm -hmm. not gonna put in one of our sites, it was in one of the parks down here. On one side of the road was the federal park, on the other side of the road was the state park. So the feds said, well, you can't pound stakes into the ground here. So I said, okay, we went across the street and we did it on the state land because the state didn't have the same regulations and we were able to have our field day. So it's very important you pay attention to what the what the regulations are. And they have reasons, whether you agree with the reasons or not, for having these regulations. Nothing in the trees because it could affect the birds, stuff like that. And you have to find out about all of this stuff. And granted, these are only short-term uh, uses, but for long-term uses, you have to pay attention to that kind of thing too. You yeah, and none, none of those people are gonna rewrite the rules for you. <laughs> That's right. So you gotta live with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very important. If we're going to be good citizens and, you know, be able to work with all of these groups, we have to listen and work with the people. You know, especially with, with generators and gasoline, being sure you have the proper safety equipment and all of this other stuff. You know, yellow tape on the guy wires so people can see it at night. Now And now it is with the RF. You have to be sure you do RF measurements. You know, it's not so... And the commercial buildings are even stricter sometimes. And uh, you know they're being very nice to you if they let you up on the top of a commercial building because that stuff is the square inch, thousands of dollars per square inch if you want to put up uh, hmm. up there. So it's very important that we work with the building owners and security people, especially and especially in hospitals nowadays. You got to know the security people because security people are the ones that have the keys to the elevators to go up to the roof, and if they don't know who you are and you're not bad. We're not going to let you up on the roof. So you have to have dedicated crews that are pre-approved to be able to go up to the roof, even in the federal buildings, too. We we, we, we only we had to submit names every year, the four people that they would allow up onto the roof of the hospital because of uh, security, because they, they want to know that they're not allowing crazy people up to the roof because, you know, all it takes is one small... What idiot to cut a whole bunch of lines and a whole bunch of radio systems are off of the air. Yeah, very good. Very good. Dan, WL7COO, any comments? Yeah, a lot of what I could have said has already been said. And most of it goes back to the fact that it's the personal trusting relationships you have that determine whether you're going to be able to talk to whomever it is that can make decisions. Uh, the Park Service has over 400 sites nationwide, and I doubt that any two of them have the will interpret the regulatory environment identically. So around here, there was a um, AT and T um, switch in Yosemite National Park that had a permanent full time. Uh, a switch and a microwave system, permanent full-time AT&T employee duty station in the park, and actually with park housing uh, provided as part of the contract from AT&T. Oh, this guy happened to be the Elmer of Elmers of the uh, Central Valley amateur radio people. And there were repeaters put up in places all up and down the Sierra um, that he just sort of connived his way into several of which are still functional today uh, with quite good coverage. Um, 
and the state cal oes has a division of what are they calling themselves now um communication reserve unit tactile yeah the cru of the uh, tactical communications branch and the tower and tower access for state sites is controlled by california's general services administration uh, so the Comtees, some of whom are amateur radio operators, either do or don't have the blessing of their supervisors to stick a repeater in one of the state sites. Um, so the, it, it, there's no simple, um, this is the way you do it. And there, there have been some horror stories the last few years with the Forest Service because uh, they tumbled to the fact that they could charge for special use permits. And they, you know, was, there were some ill-received attempts to get the amateur radio service to treat the amateur radio service like a commercial entity when it came to issuing um, requirements for special use permits. Uh, so it, it varies from where you are and who you know. Um, and it, it, you said something a minute ago that I, I think should be reinterpreted. You said something like, no official's going to uh, change the mind for you or change the regulations for you. Well, they don't change the regulations. A sign of good management is interpretation of the regulation in the environment you can justify. Um, good point. That, that's that's about the size of it um and, and, and like i said i would guess that approaching half of the com t's and cal oes as gsa are amateur radio operators and in some areas yeah maybe the supervisor knows or doesn't know what's in the uh, shelter or on the tower um, and, and CHP is a whole different story. They have a standardized, beautiful, very expensive tower that goes up at all CHP detachments. It's the same thing. And depending, I mean, in downtown LA, they may be a little bit crowded. Log periodics on them. But, yeah, around Big LPs. Here, around here, you got to squint to see the antennas. Uh, so a lot comes down to, uh, well, in one case, we had a detachment commander who was an amateur radio operator, um, although it, he was um, not sufficiently interested to say, yeah, go ahead and put stuff up on this tower. Because um, they had their own staff different than the Comtees that were part of California's Office of Emergency Services. General Services Administration, but mm. even though CHP is a, is a branch of the same state right. function. Right. Speaking Anyhow. of state functions, I wonder if maybe we could uh, uh, hear from uh, Frank uh, AG Seven QP. Uh, he's uh, by the way, Dan. By the way, is the uh, section emergency coordinator for those who do don't know for the San Joaquin Valley section of Aries. And uh, Frank is the uh, Section Emergency Coordinator for Eastern Washington. And uh, Frank, I mentioned earlier that I was told by the folks up, the league folks up there, that that most of the repeaters are on state land, not federal land. Do you have any comment on how easy or hard that is to do? Uh, not really, but we have heard um, the Department of Natural Resources in Washington State um, a couple of years ago um, had an, um, an officer that decided they did not like amateur radio and they started removing repeaters uh, and trashing them. Hmm. Um, the um, emergency management department um, started screaming. It's sort of been put on hold from what I understand, but has not been resolved. Um, we are trying to um, establish a statewide uh, repeater networks that work. Um, and the state does have supposedly some repeater networks that are supposed to be working, especially on six meters. Um, but uh, there are gaps, and it's a work in progress. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. You also mentioned shares, Marty. Yep. Um, take a look at the shares directory, and you'd be surprised at how many military share stations are in Alaska, for instance, mm -hmm. as compared to <laughs> hardly any um, other than uh, one or two that are amateur radio operators of the uh, gateways or um, RMSs up there. Yeah. And and the same is true in other states. It's just that it's, it seems real popular in Alaska, I suppose, because HF is the only way they know they're going to be able to talk to each yeah, other. Yeah, they got an awful lot of area to cover. Yep. The whole key is to know the people that maintain the buildings and own the buildings. And it's it's so so it's a lot easier if you have a good liaison with the owns the buildings that all of these other groups buy. This way, if you have to, you can put a little bit more pressure on them to get access. Yeah, Tom was exactly right. I, and I, I swear there used to be a GSA regulation that building managers were supposed to seriously consider approving installation of amateur radio stuff on the roofs. I haven't been able to find it, so I don't know what happened to it. Um, but if you could just refer to that, it, in other words, it was a, a, a check that building managers had to either check or not on their annual performance <laughs> accomplishments. Yeah. So, hmm. Tom, you had, you had it for quite a while. You want to jump in here real quick? Tom? Sorry about that. Um, two things. I wanted to share with you apropos of some of the other discussion that's just occurred. Um, we had a power security problem on one of our sites and what it was, was essentially uh, housekeeping staff would go into that area to clean and they would unplug our repeater cabinet <laughs> to gain access for their cleaning equipment and never think about restoring it. Um, and luckily that repeater cabinet in the bottom had several uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries that I had come up with. Uh, I hope you'll forgive an aside, but when when they hold these big conventions in towns, you should try and get somebody over there because if they want the venue to provide power to a display, the IBW is the provider and it's expensive. So the vendors bring in batteries that they have no intention of taking away. One clean off alone got me several 100 amp hour batteries mm. that it could use for one weekend, which I distributed to the uh, Aries participants that actually needed that sort of thing. Got a little bit of flashback from the people who didn't need it, but wanted it anyway, but that's par for the course. Uh, and the, the cure to that, that I had to come up with, I proposed it to the building management, was to put a metal outdoor in-use cover over the receptacle and then lock it with a lock that they, it was a combination lock. So they had the combination and so did we, but nobody else did, especially not housekeeping. No problem ever since. Uh, and then the other thing that I'll mention is when you need to move equipment like repeater and tennis, that takes an elevator operator. Because normally the way the stairs are configured in federal buildings, you can't swing them around the corners. The pattern they build them in just doesn't allow that. There are exceptions, of course. So, so think about that. So one of the devious things we did was to get a search group to decide they wanted to drill on a Tyrolean traverse and they went to the county building it was on and drilled on a Tyrolean traverse, which you used to get stretchers out of a, a structurally compromised building, right? Well, our antenna came up that Tyrolean traverse line. Oh, no mock, elevator mock inspector <laughs> involvement or any of that. It was just one of the things that came up the line, and we got the antenna up there. So just a little bit of inventive thinking sometimes will get you around us. And since it was not us, but CERT doing it, and they're CERT nonetheless, you know, permission was easily forthcoming and no problem at all. And when we were briefly asked why we're there, the CERT 
uh, organizer said, they're here in support of us. Oh, okay. <laughs> because wow. we had taken the time to get hams involved with CERT so that they could serve as long haul for the CERT's short range radios out of their operational area and, and had gotten club members and people like that to uh, participate actively for them, providing them radio support. You know, look like, like, uh, Gene was saying several others, you know, and uh, you, Barry, it's all about finding a complementary and friendly way uh, to get things done so that you don't have to resort to anything else most of the time. And, and when you have to resort to something else, don't, don't do it sloppily. Plan it very carefully because once it's rejected once officially, no is the easiest word to utter in the entire English language. Yeah, good point, Tom. You know, I, some, that reminds me of another issue, and it may not apply in some buildings, but uh, <clears throat> roof penetrations can be very problematic. If you've got a place that has its, you know, for example, Los Angeles County's Medical Alert Center is in a rented building, and they have, you know, the elastomeric roof covering, and they're not allowed... To, for any any uh, roof penetrations at all same thing is true of a lot of hospitals and other places so uh if you know if you're looking at a site think very carefully about how you would route the cables so a they're not trip hazards you know for a drill we could run a cable in the in the door of the mac but we can't we can't put stuff in the building we can't put holes in the walls uh uh the la city uh, general services has the same rules for fire stations you know, we, we we can't just penetrate. So even when you're mounting something, look for non-penetrating roof mounts. So usually big angle iron jobs with sand, sandbags or concrete blocks on them uh, that don't require any drilling into the roof itself. And then routing the cables through some access point or weather head that will uh, that will not cause uh, you know any any roof leaks or void their warranty from the uh, from the roof ceiling provider. Very important because in West Palm Beach, city of West Palm Beach built a brand new EOC on the third floor of a brand new fire station. But they didn't ask anybody that knew anything about radios at all. So they built this wonderful sealed room. And then they realized, okay, you know, they had and they, they did have telephones because telephone cables they ran up from the bottom up. And so they we all went up and we took a look at everything. It's okay. Where are the police radios going to be? Where are the fire radios going to be? Where are the ham radios going to be? I said, oh, over there. And how are we going to get our antennas to? Them? Oh, we didn't think of that. We need so, to put a hole in the roof, but we can't put a hole in the roof. Well, you should have thought of that. They could have built in a hole. You know, they a fairly rough conduit. Yeah, and, 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 and the LA City EOC is built with no, no place to route cables for antennas either, except in the server room, they have they have a couple of conduits that go out, and so you have to run everything through there, and of course also through grounding blocks. And if you put it in another cable, you have to add your own grounding block to the bus. Um, and that means our, our radios are in a server room on the second floor, and we're operating down in the uh, off the uh, room off the EOC. So all our radios have to be remote capable, remotable. And that includes our uh, our uh, codam that we have for shares, and includes our TS two thousands for HF and VHF and UHF. So we and and we even have remotes to other buildings. So uh, it adds a layer of complexity, especially when they say, "Oh, we're switching everything to Windows eleven, and now your your uh, control software may or may not be compatible." But yeah, think you know, thinking about that stuff ahead of time is 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 really. Uh, it can be eye-opening. Especially, you know, a lot of people don't think, well, why don't we ask somebody that might know something about this ahead of time? What and a concept. What a concept. In the ceiling, and then you won't have to worry about it because you can make conduits that are safe. Yeah. We have a couple of uh, horror stories in chat about, uh, uh, you know, people where uh, <clears throat> the equipment was uh, taken in lieu of back rent where they actually had a no-rent agreement or by eminent domain, and they had to either sue or otherwise wait a long period of time to get the equipment back. So again, have if you can, if you've got a friend who will help you out, that's great, but try to get something in writing that will uh, 
you know, that will give you some ground to stand on if your equipment suddenly is locked up. Even if you have a good relationship with people, get it in writing. Because people change and the, the writing doesn't change. If you have something in writing, everybody usually has something to reference to, to and they will usually honor it. That sounds like a marriage to me. Almost. it honest, Honestly, it almost is. One thing you'll find with government agencies is that management changes more frequently than in the commercial world. Mm -hmm. So. so it, yeah, definitely. You know, in, in case of L.A. City Fire, the, uh, you know, the folks in the disaster preparedness unit, they rotate in and out of there about every two or three years. So you get on a good relationship with somebody and all of a sudden you got somebody new. Hopefully it's somebody you've worked with before, but not always. Yep. That's right. Very important when you're working with, you know, trying to work with other agencies. Yeah. If you want to put repeaters. Same, other... same is true, by the way, of hospitals where, you know, whoever is the disaster coordinator, uh, that's a position that may be part time. And they're, they they also have duties in the ER or somewhere else. And and they will often change, either change positions or change facilities. And you've got somebody brand new in there. So uh, those transitions can uh, take a lot of time to manage. So you got to be sure you, you meet with the people and you know everybody. And if there's a change, you want to be sure that they notify you. There's yeah. so much change and you meet with the new people. Okay. Dan, I'm uh, I'm going to have to pull off at this point. So uh, we can either leave it going and uh, I'll say 7-3 or whatever you want to do. Well, unless there's something more to add, this, is, this has been a great presentation. It's worked out really well. Um, let's throw it out there real quick. Is there anything more anybody want to add here? But if not, we'll just pull the plug and call it a good day. Tom mentioned in the chat about being careful with hospitals with coax and be sure you know the maintenance people and you should so you know uh, what's going on because he said that the hospital cut coax in their roof for their uh, repeater system so they could pass the joint commission inspection. So you got to know ahead of time what that's going on. So, like I said, with this other building, they were resurfaced the roof and they cut all of our coax, lasting us ahead of time. You got to be sure you monitor all of that. Yeah, we, we've gone in looking for uh, the VMED radios, which are commercial banded, and uh, we trace it along and we find that nobody's used it in years and the coax was cut and has spider webs on it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know uh, Ventura County out here, uh, they have a uh, every two months, they have an activation where they go and um, <clears throat> go to all of their served facilities and get them on the air to make sure nothing has changed, you know, because of maintenance or construction or whatever, and kind of verify that everything's still working. It's probably a good practice if you got the people in time to do it. In pre-hurricane season, we go around to all of our shelters and check to be sure the coax is still hooked up and it hasn't been cut. And we check the radios to be sure everything works. Very good. Okay, Tom, you got your hand up here. You want to wrap some ribbons on this? Yes, sir. As to hospitals, if you provide their emergency communications at zero cost, you're their buddy. And it takes a little while to get it going. It takes some real work. But the joint committee is not going to leave there with a good grade if they don't have emergency communications. And we were in touch with a hospital trying to get them to allow us to do some coax, like Barry was just talking about. And, you know, it seemed like it was taking forever. And then the joint committee got there. And just before they got there, we overheard the conversation. Make sure that cell phone is in the right place. They had a radio phone for satellite. It was supposed to be their backup communication. And I said, uh, excuse me, but do you have an account on that thing? And they said, well, we don't know. I says, well, I'll tell you, accounting does know. And if you don't have a, an account for that phone, it's like carrying around a cinder block. It's absolutely useless to you. Nobody can force satellite operators to give you time on that, no matter which hospital you are. And they checked and sure enough, all five of their facilities in the area had satellite phones that had no way to use the system. Oh. But, they, but they caught it in time for that joint accreditation thing. And also we provided them a way to pass by showing up and being there in their little closet-like radio room when the joint committee came through. 
So, you know, we have reason to hope that if we ever need to turn to them for something, they're going to remember that we got them through a joint committee inspection without a crisis. And, mm -hmm. and hopefully that'll keep us on their good side. Very and the good. last thing is, having been an International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers menu, member, I have a pathway into many facilities that most people don't ever think about. It's not the GSA. It's not this. It's it's the IBEW members or the CWA members that actually go in there and work on the communications equipment. So in one facility where we were in the low part of the building and, and the tower part of the building was a nice cut in the antenna pattern about 90 or more degrees wide, uh, we just talked with one of the Communications Workers of America members and he said, oh yeah, I'll take care of that next time I go out there. And all he did was dry, run a dry ethernet pair up through the telephone closets during his own work. And that means you don't have to go to the uh, computer people, the computer techs of the hospital, because they're panicked about you introducing something onto their system. But a dry cable, they don't worry about at all. It isn't connected to them. They don't even know it exists. And it put our radios up on the roof uh, where they had a full pattern and were much higher. It's a nine-story tower. So keep your eyes open for those back doors. Mm -hmm. That's right. Cool. Okay. Is there anybody else got any comments before we pull this plug? Thank you all for coming. This was great. Hey, thanks for all the great comments. Yeah, you... Paul, uh, ISA, one thing. Okay. Um, it used to be, I think, the only um, group that did the hospital accreditation was the Joint Commission. But the last couple of times, I think we had ours done, they actually um, had some other companies that can do the same thing. So it might go by a slightly different name, depending on which company they hire to do. Noted. Used... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we're the accreditation. I mean, it, it could be multiple agencies now. Yeah. No, I mean, instead of the joint commission, we had a different group do it, but it was for the same thing. Okay, well, thank all you. Right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks, all. Okay, with that, I'm going to pull the plug. Say 73s. Have a great weekend. Hopefully, I'll see you guys next week. All right. Th thank you, Dan. Thanks, everybody.